Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I can uh, introduce you to our penultimate session. I love to use that word. For those of you who are not uh, uh, native English speakers, it means the next to the last one. Uh, and I think it will be a very interesting one. And indeed, it relates very nicely to the previous session, because we are also going to be talking mostly about cases. And we're also going to be talking about uh, innovations that have a social impact. That's the key theme here. And as we did last with our last talk show session, I will very briefly just introduce our speakers. You have their longer introductions in the conference material. They will speak for five minutes, not more, uh, to make a brief presentation. I will probably ask a few general questions of the group when we're finished with the presentations. And then we will open it, as we have in the past, to uh, colleagues in the room to ask questions, uh, make comments, and so on. And one of the purposes of these sessions is to have a conversation both among us on the panel and also with you. So we see this session as a conversation as well as presentations. In fact, more of a conversation than presentations. Um, our first speaker is uh, L Lorraine McElrath, who is coordinator of community knowledge initi initiatives at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Lorraine. Thank you. Marhaba. Lukon. Um, thanks to you all for um, welcoming me here in um, the Kingdom of Saudi. I would particularly like to thank the hospitality of um, Dr. Salem. Thank you so much, and the Ministry for all their care and attention. And um, I thank all of, my, all of my, my new international friends and my local Saudi friends for having me here. Um, my name is Lorraine McElrath, and I guess I'm bringing a very practical dimension to what the social responsibility of the university means from directing my own work in Ireland through the Community Knowledge Initiative for the last 10 years. And I've used the concept of campus cartography to try and um, bring to light the work that I do um, within higher education. Um, I think our own past and our own past lives, um, that of our countries, our regions and our nations, have all left an indelible mark upon us and upon our institutions. So social, cultural, political, artistic, literary and civic issues impact upon us all and our institutions. And I think within the context of Ireland, my own biography of um, a child of the Northern Ireland conflict growing up where there was political turmoil on my island, um, featured very strongly on my own professional career path. And I guess within my own formal training and education, as a very young child and right up to the age of 18 to when I left school, there was no space in my curriculum, no space in my formal education training where we were allowed to engage with the political conflict and I felt that was a massive oversight. So ever since that time, I felt compelled to engage students in issues of civic, social, cultural, political issues in the classroom, um, engaging them in conversations and experiences um, that will bring to bear an understanding of them and their role within the wider society. And I think that's very true of our colleagues who are faculty as well. Um, they must see and conceive of themselves as academic citizens. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read out a quote by my current president of Ireland, uh, Michael D. Higgins, who um, was a member of faculty at my own university. And he has a very sharp sense of the role of the university within society. But he says that universities are both apart from and a part of society. 
They are a part in the sense that they provide a critically important space for grasping the world as it is, and importantly, for reimagining the world as it ought to be. The academic freedom to pursue the truth and let the chips fall where they may be isn't a luxury. In fact, it's a vital necessity in any society that has the capacity for self-renewal. But universities are also a part of our societies. What's the point unless the accumulated knowledge, insight and vision are put to the service of the community? With the, pri with the privilege to pursue knowledge comes the civic responsibility to engage and put that knowledge to work in the service of humanity. And this is not just an Irish calling. I think this is a global calling. And I think the work that we do for humanity takes on different flavors in different nations. And I think within the context of Ireland, we're dealing with the fallover from um, the inflated economic boom termed the Celtic Tiger and our current recession. And we're dealing with all kinds of issues like poverty, homelessness, um, high taxation, um, the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, to mention a few. And of course, our historic past as a post-colonial nation, the famine in the mid-1800s, and the conflict all press upon our current um, context. My own um, contemporary work at the university um, in, in Galway um, is called the Community Knowledge Initiative. It was funded by Chuck Feeney, who is an Irish-American, who set up the duty-free system of shopping some decades ago. He sold all of his shops, made billions from it, and from that point in his life, he decided he, he had enough money and he wanted to spend the rest of his life giving his money to, um, to social change. Um, so he invested in the Community Knowledge Initiative at my university, which essentially created a series of pathways for academics, faculty, students, and the community to intersect on a range of maps. And I see myself as the campus cartographer. And I think it's a very uh, beautiful kind of concept to, to dream of this work. Um, uh, from reading from the academic discipline of, and the literature around cartography, um, Taylor in 1993 uh, described um, a person who engages in cart cartography. The, the word engagement was deliberately chosen to show an ongoing commitment of a serious nature. Cartography and, and this engagement is not static, it's dynamic. And a cartographer and cartography change, so too does the cartographer because the cartographer is not a helpless victim of change, but an active agent of change. And I think really we should see our work within higher education and social responsibility and higher education as a type of cartography, where we're drawing from past maps, the past historic maps that the university have created around the whole area of engagement. We're, we're, we're redressing them, reimagining them, deepening them, and maybe even creating new pathways or roads for connectivity between the university and the wider community. Um, I think over the, the course of the last 10 years, um, the possibility for dreaming about change and cre creating change in terms of civic engagement um, has resonated with an awful lot of my colleagues within higher education. and that yeah. A national review that we conducted across the higher education system in Ireland indicated that many faculty are actually doing this work, but very often it's under the radar and covert. And I think it's timely, not only nationally within Ireland, but globally, to push the door open and, and create more spaces and maps for engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Bud Hall, who's a, a professor uh, at the University of Victoria in Canada and who has had a long career in adult education and community involvement. Bud. Thank you. Uh, Salam alaikum. I'd like to, uh, uh, to echo the gratitude that my other uh, panelists have for Dr. Salim and the, the Ministry of Higher Education. This is my first visit to the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I've been hearing about this place for a long time, and it's taken me 69 years to get here, so <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm, I am a, a settler Canadian. 
Um, I work, live and work on the traditional territory of the Coast and Strait Salish traditional peoples. These are the, the, the traditional land of indigenous people on the, the far west coast of British Columbia in Canada. Um, we approach social responsibility in many ways in Canada. One of the ways that we approach it is through the use of the language, the discourse of civic engagement. And when we speak of civic engagement uh, in our Canadian universities, uh, we're speaking of four things. We're speaking of, <clears throat> of student engagement, sometimes we've heard it referred to as uh, service learning uh, here in this conference. We, we speak of knowledge mobilization, which I think is a Canadian term, but it means making sure that the research which is generated inside the university has some impact in society. So it's not just put in a library shelf or into a journal which is only read by, by three people. Uh, a, a third area is the area of, uh, of university policies, and that's the, the, the attention to uh, incentive systems, to recognition for high quality work, uh, to the reward systems for people working in universities. And the fourth, fourth area, and that's the area that I'm most uh, engaged in, is this area that they call community-based research. Community-based research is a contemporary term for an entire family of concepts, uh, from uh, uh, participatory research, participatory action research, um, Quali you know, qualitative research of various kinds, <clears throat> a whole variety of approaches, photo voice, um, arts-based research, feminist research. And, uh, there have been, over the last 20, 25 years, a variety of, of approaches. The, 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 my origins, my uh, introduction to this, came from my work in the Global South, came from work in Tanzania, came from work with people like Rajesh Tandon, like uh, Orlando Falls Borda, uh, Paulo Freire. These were people who some 30, 35 years ago were talking about knowledge, talking about uh, benefit to community, and were talking about, um, you know, whose knowledge count, values, and the need for social change. Some 25, 30 years before a lot of, before, you know, this, this stuff became uh, popular or b has had a rebirth a rebirth in, in, in modern terms. So there are, uh, I'm interested in the, in the challenges in the co-creation of, of knowledge. So what are the challenges when you want to, when you believe that knowledge is created, you know, in places other than the university, um, and you want to work with community groups, uh, social movements, you know, uh, government, other organizations, um, um, what are the challenges? And I, I'll just mention some of them and then maybe these will come up again in the questions. So we have a challenge of preparing uh, students or preparing academic staff because working in the community is, is actually a very, it's a skill. And, and it requires a lot of sensitivity and a lot of ability to listen, which we're not trained to do as, as scholars. We have to recognize that the knowledge cultures in the community are different than the knowledge cultures in the university. Knowledge cultures, and I can come back to that one if anybody is interested. Um, we need to think about the challenge of linking on the university side an interdisciplinary response to on the community side a multi-sectoral questioning. Uh, I can also come back to that. And we need to attend to, uh, to be supportive of and find ways to support the building of research capacity within civil society organizations themselves. Now the one key dimension, the, the key to community-based research is that the question originates in the community. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. Our third speaker is uh, Sally Sosnowitz, who is Assistant Dean and Director of Community Studies at the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology in Cambridge, USA. Sally. Thank you. 
I'm excited to be here uh, because you're talking about such an innovative subject in an innovative way, and I've enjoyed hearing the talks of the other speakers as well. Um, and I've noticed that everyone has a very thoughtful approach to how social responsibility is handled at their institute. And at MIT, things are very experimental, cutting edge. It's a community of problem solvers who are very interested in figuring out the next thing. And it's very hard to come up with a program that's going to attract people who are so interested in going their own way. So we decided in order to cultivate innovation at MIT to become as innovative as we could ourselves. And instead of setting up a program that required MIT students to all behave in the same way, we set up a program that enables each MIT student to follow his or her own path to do what they want to do with communities. So instead of setting up community partnerships ourselves, we listen to each MIT student who comes into our offices. We deal with about 3,000 MIT students a year. And when some of them say that they've noticed that a community lacks something because the thing doesn't exist and they want to create it, we have a support system for them called the Ideas Global Challenge. And we accept that student's own ambition to change something in the world. And we help them through a system of queries and support and some f financing to send them out to work with communities on their own. So the partnerships belong to those students to invent and innovate the things that they want to create. And some of them create new technologies through this process. Some of them create new social systems through this process. Um, and I think the most important aspect of it is that we listen respectfully and that we suggest to them that they figure out how to take the next steps. So it's a kind of antithesis of many of the support systems that we've heard about that are so carefully planned and so wonderful in their own outcomes. But in our case, we always devolve things back to the student to figure out the next step. And just that conversation of talking with them, we have found enables them to go ahead and take that step because there's a trust there. So the way the Ideas Global Challenge works is complicated, and I only have a few minutes, so I won't go into it. But it basically is a system where we listen, we challenge the students to think creatively about what it is they want to do. We trust them to do it, even though some of the things that they want to do are quite improbable. And then we offer them some resources through uh, expertise that they can find at the university, which is full of expertise. We ask them to find people outside the university. And we've actually also financed a little bit of it, but we ask them to find more resources. And we've created a web interface. This is the big level of support that we offer. And we have about 5,000 active users around the world of this web interface. And I hope you might become users of this web interface. It's at globalchallenge.mit.edu. So for example, we had a student who went to Tanzania and looked at wheelchair use and found that 40,000 Tanzanians lacked adequate wheelchairs. And when they had a wheelchair, it was typically an American wheelchair that was inadequate for the roads in Tanzania, and it would fall apart, leaving them worse off than they were to begin with. So wheelchairs are a standard design. But MIT students decided that they would redesign a wheelchair for use in the developing world, have a wheelchair that's sturdy, made out of bicycle parts so it's easily repaired with local materials, and they developed a new principle to move the wheelchair that made it more able to go quickly on rough roads, and they set up levers so that it can use the upper body strength of people. Well, this is now being manufactured by local communities around the world, and it's about to go into major production. And that's one example of the way that our kind of innovative program has helped MIT students also become innovators. 
and I hope you'll have questions and I can tell you more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is uh, uh, Yves uh, Fluchiger, uh, who is uh, uh, vice dean uh, at the university, vice rector at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Yves. Thank you very much. Let me start also by thanking very much the Ministry for Higher Education, especially uh, Dr. Salim El Malik for his perfect organization of this very interesting event and conference. Um, first of all, maybe I'm going to start by defining some of the concepts that we are speaking of during these last two days. And I'm very pleased that to listen that the, there was also four dimension in the definition of social, social responsibility of the university. Uh, at the University of Geneva, we have also the same kind of approach. And uh, for me, in fact, there are a first uh, dimension of social responsibility, which is very much related to the, to the fact that our research project need to increase the well-being of the population. And this means sometimes also the economic growth. This is, in fact, the first responsibility for university just to bring uh, improvement in the well-being of the population. The second dimension for this social responsibility is very much related to the fact that we need also to take into account the capacity of our students to find a job at the end of their studies, a goal which is sometimes summarized by employability. But it is also a dimension that we would like to follow at the University of Geneva. And also, we are doing some surveys to understand how the people that students are behaving at the end of their studies. And then we need to use the result of these surveys just to change also the uh, program that we are offering in terms of education to our students, meaning that we are a dynamic university and we need also to introduce change in the uh, functioning of this university. The third dimension is related to the fact that we have a responsibility towards our employees in terms of the working conditions, the human resource policy, uh, the promotion strategies, as well as the conflict resolution. The fourth dimension is related to the fact that through the research education program and also continuing education program, we need to contribute to social justice. And this means that we need really to give equal access to education, to labor market, to professions, to health, housing, to everybody, whatever is gender, whatever is social, ethnic, or religious origins. And this responsibility should also be respected toward the rest of the world. We at the University of Geneva, we try to implement this social responsibility in terms of equity and social justice uh, through research done, for instance, in human development indicators to the participation of scholars at risk, a program worldwide which is devoted to the protection of scholars who are in life danger in their home country, and finally also through the involvement into the MOOCs revolution, Coursera. I think it's also a way for us to share our knowledge with the rest of the world. And being a French-speaking university, it's also very important to do that towards the French-speaking world of the, uh, of the world. Now, let me turn to innovation. As I told you, one of the dimension of social responsibility is really to increase the well-being of the population, which means that we need to uh, foster innovation, social innovation. But let me make sure that innovation should not be looked only in a very restrictive way, which means technical. Uh, uh, evolution, technical innovation. We need to do that in connection with innovation in social and humanities uh, because it, I think it's the combination between these two kinds of innovation that is very innovative in fact. And it's why uh, we are still a comprehensive university and want to stay a comprehensive university because we think that interdisciplinary will be something which will be very important in the future to keep these uh, challenges, to be able to combine technical and social and humanities uh, uh, evolution and innovation. 
There are some examples of that, and maybe come back to, to that uh, uh, on, the, on the question part of the, of the session in terms of energy policy. But let me just foster on the, and uh, finish my speak on finance. Because I think everybody today is, uh, will agree at least that the financial system needs to serve as a nervous system of the global economy rather than its master. And to make this change, I think we need very much to combine expertise from different fields of research. We think that the university can bring substantial academic contribution to the necessary evolution of the financial system and make it sustainable. To do this, I think we need a comprehensive university, as I told you before. This is a condition for being innovative today. I'm, I'm just finishing. And the ongoing reforms in the financial system have made several steps in the right direction by raising capital requirements, increasing liquidity buffers, and strengthening supervision of a larger number of financial intermediation. But we need also broader structural reforms in the financial system. And these reforms need also to be implemented in a coordinated way across developed and lower income countries. In this respect, we need very much to investigate how sustainable finance may have an impact to reduce poverty, to create enterprise and empower communities across the world. Um, and I just would like to finish this talk by saying that by looking at Islamic finance, we may there find very interesting implementation of this principle of sustainable finance. Let me just say that in terms of Islamic finance, we have some principle, just like first the exclusion of gambling in any financial activity, the absence of contractual uncertainties, the requirement that parties to the financial transaction must, must share in risks and advantage and rewards. And finally, financial transaction must refer to a tangible underlying asset. And I think these four principles, by applying it to finance, may be very innovative. And I think we have very much to learn about this uh, principle and also apply it in the world of finance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to take the privilege of the chair and make just a few comments really stimulated by your, uh, uh, your presentations uh, about my own university and just make one general point. Um, as you know from the bio, I'm a professor at Boston College, which is a, um, a, a private Catholic Jesuit university in Boston. We are very much mission driven. That is, we, go, we have a, uh, an, 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 an academic and intellectual tradition going back to 1540 uh, and the Jesuit order in Europe. And part of that mission is social service. And when a student comes to Boston College, he or she knows very well that part of what we do at the university is social service. And we encourage the students a lot to engage in many different kinds of social service activities in the local community, even internationally. And the university spends a good deal of resources uh, providing that kind of support. So the point I wanted to make simply is that many of our universities do have a mission that are part of what we do that is beyond the traditional research and teaching. And that, though, though, that mission, whatever it is, whatever tradition it comes from, can drive various kinds of social service activities. So I just wanted to make that point to add to what we were saying. I'd like to ask a few general questions of the group and then see if the group has any general questions for each other and then open it for a broader uh, discussion. Each of you are involved in your day-to-day -day work in, a, in quite specific activities. Some of you alluded to them but didn't spend too much time. I'd like to ask, how do you achieve your goals and are you working 
against or with the broader focus of the university. I mentioned the Boston College example. Our uh, social service activities are very much with the mission of the university, but in a lot of cases, universities may not care or may not emphasize anyway. So if you could say a little bit more, just a minute or so, about the specifics of, of what you do and how you relate to the rest of the university. I'll be happy mm -hmm. to start. Um, at MIT, the mission of the university is the betterment of humankind. And most people at MIT are working toward that mission by doing research that contributes to the welfare of the world. Um, we have a more immediate goal uh, through the Public Service Center. Our aim is to encourage immediate application of research and ingenuity and time and effort to help people immediately. And I find that given our role within the university, it's a continuum and it's very much appreciated. People come to MIT to teach, faculty to teach, and students come to learn because they want to do something. And this idea of immediate action is very important uh, given that attitude. I find that my most important collaborations are within the university and my time is spent talking with faculty and uh, administrators from various departments to create the kind of uh, congenial attitude and co-support for students that enables them uh, and enables the faculty too to get involved in this immediate application for the betterment of humankind. I think we've heard over the, the last few days that um, social responsibility isn't a, a separate pillar. It should permeate all aspects of the three dimensions of higher education. And I think from my, my own perspective of achieving goals in my university, um, it has stemmed from top-down and bottom-up approaches. Um, and it's very heartfelt that your Minister of Higher Education here is so much behind social responsibility. So I think that top-down and you as bottom-up people w will be core. But, but I feel that there's, there's an element in the middle and that's some kind of a coordinating unit or campus cartographers that will provide the in infrastructure and buttress and support, offer professional development offer opportunities to faculty, students, community, to allow them to collide and intersect and develop innovative work based on teaching and learning, research, and contribution. Um, I think uh, within the context of Ireland, because we're a small island, um, sometimes we say we're the centre of the world, but I guess it depends what way you're, you're looking at the world. Um, but what has been extremely important for us is um, to legitimise this space through the solidification of friendships with people internationally. So um, many of colleagues here, including my pal beside me on, on my left, have visited Ireland, talked about this work from their own perspective and nations, and given some kind of a, an international kudos that has given legitimacy to my president of my university to say, this is the right thing that we should be doing in this space. Yeah, okay, so we are at the University of Geneva, a public university, founded 50% by the uh, uh, canton of Geneva, 25% by the Swiss Confederation, and 25% coming from the private sector. And with the canton of Geneva, we are signing for four years a convention of objectives of, yeah. And uh, in this convention, uh, the state is asking us to implement evolution that are socially responsible, in fact. So, I mean, we are receiving some r new resources to develop this kind of objectives, and then it's easier for us, as the presidency of the University of Geneva, to convince our faculty that we need to, do, to go in this direction. At the same time, we are in a period where we, are, we, we need to make some cut in the basis program, so we are at the, from one end, and we were cutting a little bit the budget, and from the other end, giving more money to develop new field of research, new teaching programs, and it was this way that we were able, in fact, to convince 
or the faculties, which was not an easy task. In, in fact, that, that was the direction where we, want, we need to go, and it was this way that we are just also implementing this changing in our university. And every four years, we have indicators, and every four years, we need to make a report mm -hmm. saying that this goal has been achieved in at 100% or 50% and 25%, and it will then uh, influence also the next convention that will be signed for four more years. The, the University of Victoria, um, let's see, about uh, eight years ago, uh, like other universities, we do a strategic plan every, every five years, and our university takes this planning process extremely seriously, and all of the uh, kind of financial and programmatic decisions that are made subsequent to the plan, you have to refer back to the plan if you want to get any, you know, any resources or, or make some innovations. So what was important for us is that, uh, um, you know, is that we were able to get into the plan a commitment uh, on, on civic engagement and a specific commitment to, uh, to uh, you know, working towards giving every student an opportunity for an engagement uh, you know, experience and specifically to support the development of uh, community-based research and the structures to support that. So we've got that at the top, but the, you ask a very important question, are we working you know, for or against the university? We're certainly working for the university, but as we all know, universities are spaces of contestation. And there are, there are other interests also inside the university that are not aligned with uh, values of social justice, that, that are uh, more interested in, uh, you know, in a narrow idea of economic development and are, are not bothered by issues like climate change and, and are not persuaded that uh, things like community-based research is anything very useful. So there, while we are operating within a climate of of uh, you know, uh, f following the instruction or following the, the the mission of the university very much, um, there it's still a uh, an area of contestation. Thank you very much. If I could ask an, another question, uh, Sally mentioned in her um, in her remarks that um, many of the programs that you do, maybe most of the programs, and maybe you could clarify, come from student initiatives. I wonder if that's the case for the rest of us on the panel. And, are, and at MIT, are there any that don't come from student initiatives? Oh, absolutely. We have uh, service learning that uh, comes from faculty. Uh, we have uh, about 50 organizations at MIT that do outreach that are the direct result of research uh, grants from faculty. Uh, there's a huge uh, outreach component to MIT. Uh, a lot of student groups um, run programs for other students. There's, there's a great um, urge to help uh, humankind, as our mission suggests. Um, so administratively, faculty-wise, but for the innovation, uh, the innovation culture, I think that what matters to individuals, including the students, is very important to pay attention to. And I'm curious, Lorraine, at your university, are things student-driven? Yeah, I, I guess we've um, a multifaceted approach to the whole area of embedding civic engagement. So we do have service learning or community-based learning embedded within the curriculum. Um, but very often, the, I, the project ideas or the community issues that are generated come from the community into the classroom. In some instances, the collaboration comes from the students post their engagement or conversation with the community. And in other instances, a community partner may have approached the academic staff member to develop a, a certain um, solution to maybe an IT problem or whatever. Um, I think sometimes within this work, we forget that student volunteering and um, uh, student mobilization has been around for centuries. Um, students have been pivotal 
in the whole area of civil rights movements, for example. And um, I, I think in my university, we, we wanted to harness that energy and that history, in a sense. And through clubs and societies on all campuses, we have thriving student activity, which sometimes goes unrecognized. Um, so what we have done in Galway is established a, a program called the Alive Program. It's a volunteering program. Students are awarded um, certificates of honor from the, the president of the university. Um, for work that they do both in the community that exists within, within our campus but also off campus in the voluntary and community sector and that's very much passion driven student led student interest and might come from a different side of a student's personal being than what they might do through formally through the curriculum in terms of imparting their own knowledge um, within the curriculum so I feel that we're trying to engage students on, on multiple levels in terms of their own informal passion and also kind of more formal classroom-based um, spaces. Does that answer the question, Sally? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. The, uh, when we created the Office of Community-Based Research, we did the consultations with students. We did consultations with the, uh, the, the academic, uh, the administrative staff, we did, academic, we did it with the administrative staff, but we also did consultations with the community. As I said in the beginning, um, I, I, we live and work. Our university is, is located on traditional uh, indigenous territory, and the indigenous political uh, reality is very real in British Columbia, uh, and, it, and our university is, is, uh, is quite sincere. Uh, in developing, you know, new, you know, beyond a kind of colonial relationship with indigenous peoples. And when we spoke to the community uh, and different members, you know, different kinds of community, they, they found the university very difficult to penetrate. They, they found it confusing, and ours isn't a, you know, we have 20,000 students, not, you know, it's not like MIT or, you know, or some of these other universities or Ohio State. Um, and they found it difficult, and so we have put a lot of emphasis in, our, in the development of our structures in, in, in listening to the community. So I would say our work is community-driven, and our structure is actually co-governed. Co so our, our advisory board is the vice president of research and the CEO of the United Way of Greater Victoria. And then when, when we get the, the, the interest, the issue, that the community is looking at, then we try to find, uh, you know, students or academics who can help, you know, respond to. Uh, we can't always do it, but we, we try that. In fact, at the University of Geneva, we have two channels for changing the program. The first one is really the evaluation of each program, of each courses, of each unit or department. That's the one way where we can find, in fact, that sometimes the program is no more adapted to what the students are um, willing to do or what they, are, they need or, or what the society needs. That's the first channel. And the second one was just as mentioned before, the fact that we are running surveys uh, every year uh, for, the, for the students to understand what are their needs, how they are, um, I mean, just passing their, their study at the University of Geneva, but at the same time also making surveys uh, about the employees uh, themselves, how they are uh, filling the, the, the education program at the University of Geneva. And this through channel, in fact, we are able to do this uh, modification in the uh, education program. But I must say that it's, it, it, it has never been formalized in itself. In fact, it's not one way to do that, it's just to try to understand what's going on in the society and the, the, the need of the students also. I, I think one of the interesting things that came out of this last exchange is the role of the community. That is, uh, probably some of the best of the programs take into account what the outside constituencies want. Some of you have a formal way of doing that. Others, I imagine, are more informal, but it's a, ba it's a back and forth. It's not a colonial, the, the best ones. There may be some out there that are colonial relationships in which the university is going and doing good no matter what the uh, constituents want. Uh, but I think the best ones and the ones that are really sustainable are ones that link the community that is being served um, 
with, what, with, with resources that are existing um, uh, on campus. And of course, uh, as Sally mentioned in the wheelchair case, often students can find out what it is that communities want, what's mm -hmm. important for them, and then you get a buy-in from the community and important work, I mean, that's very important work, but most of what we do is less earth-shaking than that, uh, but nonetheless uh, quite, quite useful. So I think these are all very uh, useful lessons. Um, before I open it to the audience, do any of you have questions or comments for each other? I have one, uh, um, Lorraine mentioned uh, the role of international connections and how useful those can be in supporting, you know, our own, uh, helping us to make our case inside the university. Um, if you want to say more about that, Lorraine, that would be great. I'd be interested in, in uh, my colleagues from MIT and, and the University of Geneva. How do you, uh, uh, how do you, do you find that, uh, international uh, you know networking and contacts uh, help you to uh, to to, uh, to 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 do the work that you do you have ways uh, to do to to make use of those kinds of connections I guess I find them very useful just to understand what the students go through but one of the principles of activity that we use is not to do for the students what they can do for themselves so our networks are very valuable to us, but the students have their own networks, and we don't go and investigate the community needs. Uh, Lorraine mentioned this idea of agents of change. We want MIT students to be completely independent and able to do lifelong what they want to do in the world. And we don't get in their way. So when somebody comes into my office and says, I want to go do an international project and I have not a clue where to start, I say, who do you know? Who's from a country you might want to go to? Are there student groups on campus? Are there immigrant populations in Cambridge? I don't introduce them to my networks because they need to know how to think about what they want to accomplish. Maybe along the way I'll introduce them to my networks. Now that I have an increased network from this conference, it's very tempting. But I think we need to understand the difference between our work and their work and let them have their work so they know full well how hard it is to accomplish things that need to be changed. I think international uh, relation is very important for us. It's also one way to, in fact, to reinforce the uh, social responsibility of our university because I think in, in Switzerland we have, uh, in, especially in Geneva, maybe 50% of the population living in Geneva are foreigners in fact. So, and in our university maybe 40% are for foreign countries. So we really need to also uh, be international uh, universities and also sending the students, they start at the University of Geneva and then they will finish their uh, curriculum in another uh, universities and I, I think we try really to improve and increase the number of students who are in fact mobile between the universities and also in, in terms of collaboration between universities uh, having a, an academic network is very important also for reinforcing our research projects our education program I think that uh, nowadays especially in terms of MOOCs we need really to collaborate between university. And this morning I was sitting with the University of Montreal and the University of uh, Bruxelles, ULB, because we want to do something together in the field of uh, edu distant education. Doing that alone, it will be too much for a small university as, as, as yours, so university. So we need really to collaborate with other universities. Um, well, well, I think our external friends internationally have been pivotal in our development in Ireland. Um, my university was the first university to set up a, a campus cartography structure, if you like, and in the last 10 years we've managed to affect national policy so that now the government in its um, current visionary statement for higher education to 2030 has placed engagement as a central aspect alongside teaching and learning and research. And I think that has been driven for the most part from authors internationally within the field as well as our own scholarship that has emanated most recently within the context of Ireland. Um, so without a doubt our work has been infused 
by all of the learning, scholarly work and practice that's in existence in internationally. Can I just add one? Sure. My experience has been, and it's not just in the, in the context of, of the present work that I'm in, but in, in the work that I've been doing in kind of social, the area of social change, which I've been engaged in all my life, um, when you're doing, when you're trying to create structures, whether it's in civil society or it's inside the university, which are, uh, which are novel, which perhaps, uh, you know, which are innovative and perhaps go against, uh, you know, some of the traditions in that organization, be it a, you know, a, a business or a, an NGO or a university, you need some kind of uh, extra kind of support. And I've found that the, the, that having, you know, being able to tell the story, now I'm going to be able to tell stories when I go home from all of us here, all of you that I've heard, and that's going to help, you know, our community and our students, you know, uh, when they want to do this work, to, to, to feel more confident because they, and it'll make my president feel more confident so he won't think he's out on the limb, you know, Bud Hall and the University of Victoria is, crazy people, he'll, fe he'll feel more confident in being part of an international trend. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'd like to turn to the, uh, the, the community in this room and start with, with questions. If you, uh, 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 as we said before, please identify yourself. Please keep the question fairly short. And if you want to make a short statement, that's fine participate in the general uh, discussion. Yes, sir. My name is Mohamed Thabit. I'm from Omal Kura University. Um, actually, I like uh, the MIT approach of uh, giving space and allowance to students to uh, contribute to serve the community, the world community. Um, actually, this kind of approach, I think, it serves the world outside, and it also leaves the student with a feeling they can actually change things. They can have a better world, you know. Um, I think you must have a criteria for that, you know. So I'd like to find out about uh, this kind of criteria and how do you encourage the students to do so? Um, and one final thing, where do you get support for such projects? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of principles uh, that we use to help guide us and to help guide the students. I, uh, you know, and there are many of them, but a couple uh, that come to mind based on your comments. Um, the first is that students have to do real service. Uh, that this is not a pretense, it's not an experiment in the community. They need to be very respectful of the people that they work with. And I agree with my colleagues, that's the ideal. So it's collaboration, there has to be someone in the community who's willing to invest time in this because the aim of it is not that an MIT student gets to do something. The aim of it is that there's change in that community, so they need a partner to work with. So one requirement is they have to find that partner. And that process of working hard to find that partner often really helps them become well acquainted with the issues in the community. And then one other principle is real learning, that we're really trying to drive the MIT education to new heights. And if people are innovating for the benefit of the community, it's very hard to innovate. You have to know everything about what's been done already to be able to make useful changes and to do even better. And that drives the students to do that kind of research and thinking and commitment and it's interesting because I've heard that other universities really struggle with the commitment of their students. You know, they'll do something for a semester and then the class is over, they're done. Uh, many MIT students work for years uh, through their undergraduate and graduate school and on after they graduate because it's their personal commitment to the people they now know in the community to make that change. I'd be happy to tell you other principles as, as well at a later time. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting to hear all your different approaches uh, to community services. And what I want to talk about is uh, the top-down approach, um, the top-down approach versus um, bottom-up, especially if, if it's students' initiative. 
And the thing that I really want to mention is that a lot of our students, they just don't know the administrative structures of the university. They will always have just one point of contact maybe within their college. And if a top-down approach isn't really that clear, then usually any initiative is um, diluted by the time it gets to the colleges. And on the other hand, students often do want to do things, but then the colleges themselves don't have the authority to help them with resources. So I was wanting to ask Sally especially, what do you do for resources on a college level? And also, what do you do if students come with improbable projects like you mentioned? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, well, uh, what we do for resources is uh, at, the, at the Public Service Center, we do a lot of fundraising. That's part of my job. Uh, we seek corporate sponsorships, we seek government grants and foundation grants, uh, we seek private donations. We try to amass some resources so that we can do at least initial funding for the student projects. If they need to travel, they can go somewhere and start working with the community. Um, but it gets very expensive very quickly. And so what we try to do is help students, again, think through if we can raise money from foundations, so can they. Uh, if they're really good at what they're doing, they ought to be able to convince other people to support their idea the same way we convince people to support our work. And so we send them out, and they've been very successful at amassing the resources themselves. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if that answers your questions completely, but again, it's that trust that these students are going to change the lives and improve the quality of life of people in the world. And they're going to have to work hard at doing that. And it, they're going to need some sustained funding beyond what we can supply for a student project. And so these things are real. One uh, interesting model is that many students start companies or nonprofits. And we believe in that company structure because Business is a great way to deliver the goods to people at an affordable price. And so uh, they, this often turns into a career for MIT students to do social good through good business. Um, if I can make two, two comments in reaction to the question and, and uh, what Sally said. Um, uh, at, at Boston College, there are some programs uh, which, the, which the university itself sponsors, for example, um, deep and long-term relationships with uh, schools in the area, where the, a variety of programs, some are invented by the students and some have been there for a long time that the students p can participate in uh, that are um, a part of the social outreach um, mission of the institution as well as ideas that come percolate up from the students themselves. Wanted to make one other point. These kind of activities, and I'm sure we would all agree, can be, as Sally said, transformative for the students who are involved in them. So it's not just, um, it's not just, it's not only uh, for uh, actual service that we perform, but it's the experience that the students get in the process of doing the service that can change and often does maybe it won't change the world very much but it changes them builds careers builds certainly experience uh, and that's one of the reasons we we want as a university to to try to have as many of our students be involved in social improvement in the long run, as well as the short run. And getting them to do that on campus is a very valuable way of uh, instilling in them the, the, that missionary drive to be of service. And if, if I can respond to the second part of your question very quickly, you asked about improbable projects. You know, I sit there every day and maybe I'll meet with 10 students a day, uh, as well as my other activities. And uh, they'll walk in and they'll say, uh, people in the, uh, above the tree line in the Himalayas uh, are nomadic, but the only 
uh, source of fuel is either dung, uh, little scraps of wood, or huge cement mirrored solar cookers. I, don't wanna, I want to invent something that helps them, so I'm going to invent a portable solar cooker. Well, there are portable solar cookers. They don't work very well, and you can't acquire the parts in the Himalayas. So the students invented a yak hair and mylar solar cooker and wanted funding for it. Okay, so we gave them a little bit of funding. Uh, this is now a major enterprise called One Earth Designs. Uh, they won $500,000 in the Netherlands uh, at an award. We gave them their plane ticket. Uh, they set up this company and they work with the indigenous people to invent energy resources. And this is a very efficient solar cooker. It also provides home heating. You know, so we take the ideas very seriously. Uh, when students walk in and they say, I want to drill to the center of the earth to create energy resources, we're a little skeptical. It's an expensive enterprise. But we listen respectfully and have them think through the process of deciding whether they're going to pursue it. Any comments from? Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, in, in, in Ireland, we don't have much money at all in higher education, and my, my institution is a public institution. And I don't want to say that this is a cost-neutral space, but I think in terms of students generate, generating ideas towards some small change within community, it, it doesn't have to cost anything at all, to be honest. Um, and I think part of your question was top-down versus bottom-up. I think the bottom-up can be the easy bit. Um, I, I know I have so many collegial uh, faculty colleagues who do this work for pedagogical reasons. They feel it's a, it's a good way to, to teach, kind of drawing from Eric's talk yesterday, tasting the curriculum, tasting experience. They do it from personal motivations because they're committed to community or they do it because um, they've had an experience themselves in community and they want to give back to students. I can only imagine in the current global climate that it must be so difficult being a president of a, or a vice chancellor of a university with pressing economic issues on the doorstep in many jurisdictions. And I know my own president is dealing with so many negative issues that he needs a lot of positive stories to kind of um, scaffold his leadership. So I think in a way, if, if people in Saudi and Saudi universities are doing this work, they should find mechanisms and avenues to articulate those positive stories upwards towards the university management team. Um, and I think from that develops uh, top-down support. You can influence policy within your institution, maybe even nationally. And um, in my university, we've recently created uh, vice deans for civic engagement in every college. They, they're now our champions in every college, and they articulate our message downwards and upwards within the institution. Thank you. Let's I have a question for Lorraine and Nieves from Argentina. Uh, you have talked about Galway and the Knowledge Initiative, but I would like you to talk a little bit more about the Campus Engage network, because I think the, the network you have built in Ireland among universities with uh, engagement is maybe it's useful for the rest of the countries. Um, well, I, I mentioned when the Community Knowledge Initiative was established, we, we had very few national friends because there were no other campus cartographers in other universities in Ireland. And to be honest, from a very selfish perspective, I, I knew that the funding from Atlantic Philanthropies was going to leave. And I didn't want to leave my job. And I felt I needed to ignite a fire across the country and to create some human resource infrastructure around this space. So we started talking to the Irish government, to colleagues across the higher education system, and we eventually got funding from the Irish government to set up Campus Engage, which is a national platform to support the development of civic engagement activities across the three domains and, and the three domains intersecting. Um, in that time, we've conducted a national survey that gave us some kind of a, a picture as to what practice currently existed with a kind of a future roadmap for the future. We've, um, we've consulted the government. We, we advise the government on resources, infrastructure, and policy within this area. 
Um, we've had a number of conferences and seminars that Nieves has come to, and really it's a, it's a collective space for people with a, a passion and practice in the area um, to take comfort and, and to be inspired by other people to move forward in this area. Um, the Campus Engage Network, it, it did um, the, the initial funding for it, which was significant within the context of Ireland, um, ended in, in 2011, um, but then again um, in, in the latter heart, half of 2011, the government reinvested in this space. We're just uh, about to appoint um, a national coordinator. The project has now been mainstreamed and is now hosted by the Irish University Association in Dublin, and it's now governed by uh, the presidents of universities in Ireland. So I, I think we're at, at nascent stages of development, but the future looks very bright in terms of the national platform. Thanks, Nieves. And I, I think, um, just one small comment, uh, <coughs> I think one of the lessons from this last interchange <coughs> is and maybe a, an interesting lesson for Saudi Arabia is to get the universities involved collectively in the effort uh, to, to try to make sure that these issues get on the national agenda. A beginning, of course, is the fact that this conference on this theme is being held. That's a very important first step. Yes. Hello. First, I would like to thank uh, Ms. McLaren and Ms. Hal by appreciating us by saying assalamu alaikum. And I'd say alaikum assalam. Uh, can I ask you, Mr. Eve, about uh, what do you think about foreign students when they come to pursue their higher education in Switzerland uh, universities? Uh, would they be familiar with the Switzerland culture, especially when they speak, almost speak four national languages? Uh, and uh, on the other side, if you go to America or Canada, they only speak one language. So I think it, uh, it will be easier for the student to go to Canada and the US. Uh, I would uh, like to hear your opinion as well as uh, your opinion too. Thank you very much. In, in fact, I think the, the yeah. fact that the University of Geneva has a lot of foreign students is something which is very important for our students coming from Geneva and from Switzerland because this is a diversity which is the world in fact today. So in fact, being able to make their studies in such a a campus, I think it's, it's really important. So it's why we need really to attract more and more foreign students, also sending our students to go abroad because uh, the world now is much bigger than only Switzerland. In Switzerland, we, we need to speak at least uh, German, French, and also Italian. That's the first way, in fact, to be open to the others. But then we have really to be open to the, to the rest of the world. So I think it's, it's really important. It's really part of our strategy to, just to be able to attract uh, more and more students from, from, from foreign countries. Even sometimes if it's on not, not always easy in terms of the authorities in, in Geneva or in Switzerland because for the community, for the Geneva contents, we are in fact funding our universities. The main goal for them is just to serve this community. But serving the community right is also to open this community to the rest of the world. Do any of you want to comment on I have a small comment. The, 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 the issue relating to the role of international students in service learning uh, and related activities can be very important, and we haven't mentioned it here in this conference. There are about three million international students in the world today. Saudi Arabia, of course, is a, one of the major sending countries uh, for international students. Saudi Arabia has in, in various uh, parts of the world, uh, educational missions which help Saudi students adjust, get their money, and so on, supervise them. Um, somehow for us in the receiving countries, all of us on, uh, on this panel are uh, in countries that receive foreign students, uh, and others who are on the sending side, to think through carefully how we can involve the international student community in service learning. I don't have any knowledge directly of whether at Boston College, where more or less half of our students are involved in some kind of service activities, if our international community is also involved. I rather doubt it. 
So this is an, a whole area that we can, we can do some interesting work. Hello, uh, my name is Katie Fallon. I'm a student at NUIG in Galway in Ireland. Um, just listening to Sally talk about how the university approaches their students, um, I thought it was very inspiring that they seem to place so much trust and faith in the student's ability to uh, go out and change the world. Um, and at NUIG there's definitely like a lot of opportunities to volunteer in the community and it's very much interlinked in the city. But um, through my own course, which is humanities, um, human rights, sociology, politics, economics, uh, unlike maybe engineering where they do a technical project and the students collaborate on that, there's very little opportunity for students, for instance in economics, to get together to discuss the issues that Ireland faces at the moment. And I don't think the lectures, have, not the lectures, but the curriculum uh, takes into account any kind of vision for what their students could do in the future. And we're studying it because we're interested and because we want to pursue, you know, the way we're facing so many challenges, why not try and harness our energy? And I was just wondering if you know, any of the panel could think of how do students influence the curriculum that they're studying and the way that it's taught um, to engage in the community and their, their culture, I suppose. And just you know, the culture that they're living in, the issues that face them every day, such as the economy, for instance. Yeah, oh. I, c I could talk about that issue for, um, for five days. Um, I, I sometimes think in Ireland that students don't have the same power as maybe North American students because um, their fees are generated by, by the government. I think students who pay private tuition fees to private universities have more power in terms of change. Um, but I, 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 I also feel that there's, um, there's an element of a lack of confidence in some students in, in my country as well. Um, I think in a classroom with North American students and Irish students, it's sometimes North American students are a lot more articulate about what they want in terms of learning and teaching. Um, so I think there's cultural issues around that as well. But, um, but Katie, maybe it's about you going back and being brave and collectively getting groups of students together and fighting for what you want in the curriculum as well. Um, so that kind of bottom-up movement, um, yeah. I guess um, I would say step one is stop thinking of yourself as a student. Start thinking of yourself as someone with economic knowledge. There's no community project that doesn't have economic implications to which you might contribute value from your point of view and the knowledge you've acquired. And in contributing that value, you will acquire additional knowledge and skills. Find a team of people doing something you admire and contribute to it. And don't wait for the ideal opportunity. Just go to work. If I may just add one word, I think I totally agree with what was said because the innovation sometimes is really looked at only the technical uh, uh, sciences. And I, I think that nowadays, to be really innovative, we need really to combine social sciences, humanities, and technical uh, approaches. And this is really a new, and joining a team where you have this kind of uh, disciplines and kind of uh, specialization, then you can bring also your own uh, image and vision of what is really innovative in, for the social uh, society. I think it's, this is really important for me. Every one of the speakers has used the word community, um, but you've used the word community-based research. Can you clarify, each of you, what you mean by community? Who is the community? Well, <laughs> we're all community. We all reside in communities. We travel in and out of different communities. Um, a community can be two people, it can be a whole organization. Um, I think it's probably one of the most contested terms within our work and probably something that maybe in a moment we'll find out that we have very um, different perspectives on. Um, but for me, they can be formal spaces, informal spaces, it can be a clustering of a few to a, a very large um, collective of people. And um, of course, we all reside and come from communities and travel in and out um, through different communities every day. 
We, um, our work in uh, com community-based uh, research, the, you know, sort of the, the definitions of community-based research include the element of social change and value-based. And uh, they, it includes the notion that the ideas come from the community. Um, and uh, sometimes even the community does the research without any university at all. Our approach um, in, our, you know, in our experience over the last five or six years is we've put an emphasis on those parts of the community that have not been well served. So for example, we've put an emphasis on uh, indigenous uh, parts of the community. We've put in an, uh, an emphasis on people who don't have who uh, don't have a place to sleep regularly. You know, uh, on issues of we've put an emphasis on uh, issues of uh, food security, things like uh, you know uh, organic foods or or growing local foods. Um, we've put an emphasis on on people who are differently uh, labeled. You know, who who have different uh, abilities, and th those are the because those are the uh, those communities are the ones that are not benefiting uh, from the, the regular kind of economic uh, structure. And in fact, in our country, the gap between the, you know, the ones who are g getting ahead economically and, and the ones that are on the bottom is growing. So uh, for, for us, it's been quite important to, you know, to give uh, some attention because there are a lot of places in our university that give attention to other parts of the community. I don't know if that helps. Uh, for us, it's a matter of uh, asking the student, what is your expectation about who you want to work with and assist, and what is the scope of work you're willing to do? So we had a student who wanted to remediate arsenic levels in Nepal, and we talked with him about a community-to-community -community opportunity, so he taught one community um, how to build a certain kind of biosand filter that is very effective in arsenic remediation, and then uh, encourage them to spread it, planted it in several communities over the course of about four years, and then got a World Bank grant to enable the uh, opportunity to continue and so forth. Um, so it's, it's what the students expect to do, and we talk about a reasonable approach to do that. Um, 200,000 people might be using something that an MIT student created. That's a long-term enterprise that they need to think through. It's perfectly feasible, but it's a different enterprise than somebody who's working with a neighborhood in Cambridge, and that's the scope of work. For me, in fact, the community has at least three di dimensions. The first one is the local dimension. The second one is a national dimension, and the third one an international dimension. And I think university has, has something to bring to each of these communities. But I think re community research base that just was mentioned before, I think also was to di direct research toward the disadvantaged group in each of these different kind of community. That also the contribution of the university to be social responsible, just to bring something to create social justice and equity between these kind of different groups. Uh, Professor Salim stole my question, but uh, he asked it much better than me. So, so, but I do want to push on that question because uh, none of us have talked about the university as a community itself. Uh, universities, even very small ones like mine, are large communities, they are diverse communities, there are people at various economic strata, there are issues of class, there are issues of race, there are issues of gender, there are issues of equity within the university. Uh, and in some ways, it's convenient to talk of the community far away, for me as a vice chancellor. Uh, but when, and I'll give you a real example, when my students come and start talking to me sometimes in, 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 in loud voices about whether we are treating our janitorial staff mm -hmm. fairly or not. That is social engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at the history, certainly in most developing countries, I would assume even in North America as a former MIT student, I know this is a hot sort of issue there, uh, but 
certainly in many developing countries, a lot of the community engagement can and does happen within the campus. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult thing for us as university administrators sometimes to, to grapple with. That's the much more difficult fight. If I look at the history of min, much social change, it very often starts by students at their own community. Mm -hmm. And uh, very briefly, I think part of the challenge is that many places, our students are not thinking of their own university as their community. Mm -hmm. uh, they're out to sort of solve problems elsewhere. And, 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 and I think part of social education has to be to make them realize which community they themselves are part of. Um, th that's a great question, and I, I think that uh, I think part of this question of social responsibility uh, is is that you know we it's it's a it's a, as someone was saying this morning it's a mindset, and that it it cuts across all institutions. I mean it's. It, could be corporate social responsibility. It could be, you know, uh, governmental resp social responsibility. It could be, uh, you know, religious organization social responsibility. But it's also a university social responsibility. What we've found, we don't have uh, at our experience, is that we don't, we have not had a uh, what I'd call a formal um, relationship around. Um, you know, inter sort of internal interrogation, or but what I've found is that there's there's an uh, there's an alliance uh, that the one finds that um, uh, on issues uh, you know on on issues of race, for example, uh, issues around uh, how some people are treated, um, issues around how foreign students are treated. Some of them are discriminated against. Um, on issues that that what what I've found is that the, the those people the, the 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 same people who are interested in kind of civic engagement social responsibility are also the ones interested you know in in issues that internal issues that the students are raising um, issues around procurement of food is one that we've you know. Um, we've made a huge change in our university because of student pressure. They were tired of eating stuff that was being shipped in from California and who knows where. Uh, we still get some because we can't grow everything in Canada, obviously. But uh, we've now we 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 uh, we buy as much as we can possibly locally because this uh, because of the students. But I think your your question is very prescient, and we we should think more about that. If I can make one more, one more comment about that, um, you can find many examples in the United States, uh, this happens at Harvard all the time, where socially aware students are, uh, are criticizing the Harvard administration for poor treatment of the maintenance staff or lack of health, health insurance for some of their employees, outsourcing and all kinds of things. So. Um, Social awareness exists on the campus as well as off the campus, yeah. sometimes in ways which are highly embarrassing <laughs> to vice chancellors and presidents, uh, but very often important messages that need to be delivered. Uh, okay, any more concern? Please in the back. Sumaya al Suleiman. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself before. I just have a quick comment that relates to two of the questions that were there before, and it also relates to MIT, although I'm not associated with it. Uh, one of them was related to foreign <coughs> students, and the other question was about integration of student services into the, curricul uh, the curriculum. Uh, basically, I have an experience just from research, knowing about MIT, what they did in their School of Architecture was that they engaged their international students to bring in uh, any of their community problems as design problems. And this was in the late 70s, so that's quite old. And I know that indirectly, me as an architect, I benefited because my educators who came from MIT then handed me that knowledge which was local. And that was at a, at a time where everything was just westernized and we were importing knowledge. So it was very quite specific at that time. So I just wanted to share that. So this is just a simple uh, way of integrating international students and also the curriculum. So thank you. Uh, 
Rob Hollister, to Talbar Network. You've each given such fascinating and inspiring accounts of what you're currently doing. Uh, and you've, made, you've implied uh, a bit about where it might head. But I wanted to ask you to, I wanted to ask more explicitly, uh, where would you like your work to be in 10 years? Uh, resources permitting, what would you like the future to be of the aspects of your work that you care about most? <laughs> How long have I got to answer that one, Rob? I suppose at a very basic level, I would hope that this, this work is normalized across the higher education sector. I mean, I've, I've so many aspirations, but I'd be here forever talking about them. Um, so that there would be no need for Talawar or Campus Engage or other networks, that it would just be part and parcel of the way in which we do business, that it would be like um, putting on glasses or contact lenses. It's a way in which we see the world, the way in which we do business, and it's just part and parcel of it all. Um, so I, I suppose that's my future vision. Yeah. Um, <laughs> great question, Rob. I'm, I'm going to be 70 in October, so in 10 years, I, I hope somebody will invite me to a conference. <laughs> in, in terms of my university, um, I think like Lorraine, I, I would hope that, that the, this, the notion of social responsibility would become more and more uh, you know, uh, embedded uh, in, in, in the way that the university works. But I think we should not, we should not be naive we must not be naive. The world, if we look at the kind of context, the global context, and even our, in my case, my Canadian national context, it's not, it's not a world that is, that is getting more fair, or, it's getting the, or that income is becoming better distributed, or that we've solved all of the questions of you know, even gender or race or whatever. So I think that, this, the, that issues around social responsibility, I think, you know, are always, I, I think they should, we should always hope that they are, they remain somewhat provocative, that they continue to stimulate us, to, uh, to help us to open our minds, because we may feel we've, you know, that from a human rights point of view, we've achieved a lot, and we have. Over a hundred years, we've achieved enormously. But if in a hundred years time we'll look back, or we won't look back, but others will look back and say, oh, they didn't do anything by 2013, they were just, you know, just in, in primary school. So I think that we need, we, we should hope that there always is some kind of, of, uh, of, of capacity to, to continue to, to, uh, to question and, and provoke us, you know, to, to, to further thought. For me, um, right now, we have to be very selective. We have about 400 students a year for the Ideas Global Challenge. We have another 70 a year for our fellowships program, which focuses on capacity building work. Well, maybe there are four times that number who'd like to participate, but we can't accept them. So my aim, and, and many students don't want to do capacity building work and dedicate years of their lives to it, they just want to work with a community on something interesting. What I'd like to have uh, for myself is the capacity to extend to every student who wants to do public service the level of assistance that they need. Uh, and it's a lofty ambition because I've been doing this now for about 15 years and I haven't achieved it, so I'm going to keep going another 10 and get there. <laughs> I think it two, uh, two goals. The first one will be that social responsibility and sustainable development is introduced in all bachelor degree, whatever the field of disciplines. And I think this is really important that every student is faced with these concepts. That's the first goal. Maybe it will be 10 years or five years or 15 years, I don't know. But this is very important. And the second one, will be something which we'll, we can call maybe university community-based policy. We are, in fact, uh, in a policy of 
introducing what we call in Switzerland Agenda 21, which is 21 indicators about sustainable development. And we are in the process of implementing these 21 indicators. We are just started right now, and I hope that in 10 years we'll have finished this agenda. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to make one brief comment and ask a question, and then we'll go back to the audience. The comment is this, and it's related to, to what uh, Bud said. Um, I don't think uh, higher education uh, or the world is in a particularly wonderful place in terms of thinking about the context of what we're concerned with at this conference. We're more and more vocationalized in universities. Universities are more concerned with the bottom line. There's more and more commercialization uh, and all kinds of bad things. I tend to look at life uh, from a ha the glass half empty. That's my philosophy. But there's some truth <laughs> also. So we are swimming in many ways against the stream. Uh, nonetheless, it's important. And I, of course, I share all these goals. Here's the question. Reflecting on the presentations and on your own work, are there, are there lessons not negative lessons, things that you might have done differently or that are just problematic on, uh, on your campuses? No, I'm, I'm sure we all have. I have, I, I have so many lists of kind of personal failures in terms of institutional change in my lifetime that, uh, that it's, it's a wonder anybody ever invites me anywhere. Uh, my only saving, I, I, my only saving grace is that I have a lot of energy and I, I try a lot of things, and uh, about one in one in three or four work, and so then people say, "Oh, well, he's done a good job." Um, on the when we created the Office of Community-Based Research, we put a, we did a very careful uh, consultation with the community, with the faculty, and with students, um, and we had an initial buy-in from the vice president, but. Once we got the thing, once they gave us the, the franchise, we basically just took off. And I didn't pay enough attention to keeping the, uh, the people at the top, you know, on side. And that resulted in, about, after about, you know, we, we've, we've now transformed my office into a new office, uh, but and we've been successful, but we might not have had to go through the painful kind of uh, redefinition and all of that stuff had I paid a bit more attention to, uh, you know, keeping the, the, all the vice presidents and briefing the deans and doing some of that homework, uh, keeping everybody on board. Uh, and I, I should have done that, more of that, and I didn't. Other confessions? That <laughs> <laughs> Since the comments are meant to be brief, I won't go into my own disasters, but uh, one, one continuing thing that I, I wonder what you think about uh, is what my colleague Nieves called picnics to poverty. Uh, a lot of MIT students come up and they say, I want to go for two weeks to China to teach English to orphans. Uh, or, uh, you know, I want to go on a Habitat for Humanity build. Well, these things are very good learning experiences, potentially, but we can't support them. And we can't support them for ethical as well as financial reasons. Um, and it's very hard to explain to students who are very eager to participate in something that they see as experiential learning. And the impulse that they have is to do good for somebody. And it's very, it's very challenging to talk with them about um, the kind of selfishness of that aspect without hurting their feelings in a, in a un, you know, undue manner. So I try to be very tactful, but I also am trying to help them think about what it means to do public service and how hard it is. And uh, it's, it's an ongoing struggle. I've tried all kinds of approaches and I've been unduly harsh and um, unduly ineffective in even communicating the message. I don't know, maybe it's a fact that we have built at the University of Geneva some kind of very rigid structures, and we need now really to have more flexible 
structure just to be able to adapt more rapidly to the evolution of the society. So that will be something which is very difficult to pass over, in fact. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think we reside in institutions where there's, um, there's a lot of gatekeepers and there's a lot of people who resist change and don't like change. And in a way, I wish I had been braver earlier on in the last few years rather than just being completely brave now. And another thing that I, I continue to struggle with and my team continue to struggle it with is um, how genuine we are in terms of our partnership and collaboration with the community. Um, we've toyed around with different ideas for mechanisms for the, for the community. While we reside within a community, and I take that point, Actually, I think the reverse is true in Ireland, that, that uh, we find it easier to be involved in the community that is the campus rather than externally. Um, so we've had to really push people to, to move beyond the campus. But we're trying to deve develop ways where we can have genuine conversations and communication with the community that tell us the way in which we should be doing our business within the community. Um, we haven't quite, quite cracked that yet. We've toyed around with the idea of setting up a community forum, but if we set up a, an exclusive grouping of maybe eight people, how representative is that of all of the communities in which we work with? Um, so I, I think that's a very, the, 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 the whole process of reflecting continuously on your work and being genuine about what you do and being uh, ethical in terms of your collaboration with the community is kind of a constant challenge. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for some more questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. Mohamed Chobrak from Taif University. You know, from the panel, uh, from also the panel before and the other speakers, I start thinking now, is it possible to have a conference example, to bring the student with the success stories and to bring, bring them in the panel and talking about, you know, the positive and the negative things that they face? And I think this is something they will learn a lot, other students. And also we will learn from their experience what they need from us to push them for, you know, to the front. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else? We, we should probably conclude pretty soon, but we have a bit more time. Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am Dr. Hani Said from King Abdulaziz University. I just want to highlight to what uh, Dr. Avis uh, mentioned about the Islamic economic, uh, economical system. And he mentioned uh, five important principles that uh, the Islamic system highlighted. Uh, I just wanted to comment also for this, uh, that uh, the one of the principles in Islam, that, uh, that, that money should not uh, create money. The, the money should come from the work, from the production, from the services, from the plantation, from the humanity service. The money should not, uh, and uh, maybe one of the crises that, uh, one of the reasons of the crisis that happened to the United States or Europe, that is, they are not, uh, they, 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 are, they are against this uh, principle, which, uh, which the, uh, one of the things that uh, the, the bank deal, the, 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 uh, the the bank dealing with is the, the, is the money dealing uh, or uh, the, the money bring the money or the money create the, the, the uh, money. Uh, I want to ask also Dr. Evis, uh, do you have any, any bank in, uh, in uh, Swiss that uh, practice the, the, the Islamic principle and how is uh, succeed in, uh, in uh, sustainability or in uh, in uh, economical uh, success. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. In fact, it, you are right. It was a, one of the principles I didn't mention, the fact that the prohibition of interest rate, in fact. And uh, you are right, in fact, the, the, what, what happened in Europe and America, in fact, it was that the people were just looking very short-term vision with maximizing their profits in a short-term vision. 
and that was maybe one of the reasons why it was all this, this failure. And at the end, the bank were not responsible for all the loss they, they, they did. And it was the taxpayer who was in charge of taking a, into account all these losses. So I think it's something which is really, really important. I know that some Swiss banks have tried to develop uh, Islamic finance, uh, but I don't, I don't know if it was a great success up to now. I, I know that even great Swiss banks have tried to do that. It's also some kind of very close relationship between the customers and its banks, and having these new banks coming into this field, it's maybe not so easy at the beginning, but I think it's something that may be very interesting to see how much they perform, and uh, I have seen some studies proving, in fact, that using this kind of principle will bring even more success to the, to the, to the enterprise and to the banks. So, I think this is the kind of thing we'll need to also make research on that. And I don't know if there is a lot of research doing in this kind of comparison between Islamic finance and the other field of, of, uh, of finance. But I think it will be very important just to be also innovative in terms of social impact of, of research. Uh, if I could just add, we do have, uh, we do have a number of, of banks uh, that practice, you know, Islamic banking in Canada? Uh, not a lot. But we have a number of other uh, banking institutions, not the big banks. The big banks are run in Canada like they do in the U.S. or Europe and so forth. Uh, very uh, profit-oriented. Um, but there is a very interesting network of banks. It's, it's, uh, ha it, ha it draws on membership from from uh, some of the big credit unions in Canada and some European banks, it's called it's called the something like the uh, Alliance of Value-Based Banking, and it's a network that is um, uh, you know really it, it, there are a number of their banks they're doing fine, but they are uh, trying to relate their banking to to a set of values to uh, the you know more to the public good. And I, I, I think that your question is absolutely right. I think that the, uh, you know, I, I think that the kind of, uh, you know, financial uh, investment structure that we have is not, is, is not in, the, is, well, as they say, it's a tide that does not float all boats. And most of our boats are, you know, sinking in this particular tide. So the kind of question that you are asking, and the kind that my colleague from Geneva that you are, you know, that you are dealing with, you know, we talk about it in Canada as social economy. Um, I think those are very important areas for 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 research. I'd like to to thank the panel and the audience for uh, good uh, good good questions and a very good conversation. I think. Um, I would like to turn the floor over to Salim Al Malik uh, to uh, read the Riyadh statement uh, as we conclude this conference. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalam ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen. Hunaka majmu'a min rasail al-shukr al-lati atamanna an uqaddimuha li kulli shakhsin ala hida. Walakin al-majal لا يسع لتقديم رسائل الشكر ولكن أود أن أشكر معالي وزير التعليم العالي ومعالي نائب وزير التعليم العالي والذين كان متابعان لكل أحداث هذا المؤتمر أود أن أشكر أعضاء اللجنة العلمية والذي خلال سنة كاملة كانوا معنا يحضرون لاختيار الموضوعات واختيار المتحدثين الذين شاركونا في هذا المؤتمر أود أيضا أن أشكر جميع المتحدثين الذين قدموا للمملكة العربية السعودية لتقديم ما لديهم من خبرات وعلوم ومشاركتنا فيها على وعسى أن نستفيد من خبراتهم وعلمهم وأخيرا شكرا جزيل لأعضاء اللجنة الإشرافية ويرأسها معالي نائب وزير التعليم العالي الدكتور أحمد السيف سواء كانوا في المؤتمر أو من, من أشرفوا على المعرض سأقرأ البيان الختامي المؤتمر والذي فيه ملخصا كامل لكثير مما 
ذكره المحاضرون للجامعات ثلاث رسائل أو ثلاث مسؤوليات رئيسة هي التدريس البحث العلمي وخدمة المجتمع وفي الغالب فإن مسؤولية خدمة المجتمع يقل الاهتمام بها وغالبا ما يتم الخلط بين مفهوم المسؤولية المجتمعية وخدمة المجتمع التي تقع ضمن مهام الوظيفة الثالثة للجامعات ولكن المسؤولية المجتمعية مفهوم أوسع وأعمق بكثير ويمكن تعريف المسؤولية الاجتماعية للجامعة بأنها التزام بتشرب وممارسة مجموعة من البادئ والقيم من خلال وظائفها الرئيسة الممتمثلة في التدريس والبحث العلمي والشراكة المجتمعية والإدارة المؤسسية وجوهر هذا الدور الاجتماعي للجامعات هو الالتزام بالعدالة والمصداقية والتميز وتعزيز المساواة الاجتماعية والتنمية المستدامة والاعتراف بالكرامة والحرية للفرد وتقدير التنوع والتعدد الثقافي وتعزيز حقوق الإنسان والمسؤولية المدنية إن أحد الجوانب المهمة للمسؤولية الاجتماعية للجامعات هي تنمية مواهب الطلاب حتى يكونوا مواطنين منتجين ومسؤولين ومورداً كبيراً لمساعدة المجتمعات وفي عصر تتزايد فيه النزاعات السياسية في معظم مناطق العالم مهدد على المستويات الوطنية والإقليمية والعالمية يتعين على الجامعات أن تغرس في طلابها تفهم وتقدير واحترام الثقافات المتعددة والرغبة في مساعدة الأقل حظاً ومعالجة تحديات تكون أعظم من اهتماماتهم الشخصية والاعتراف بدورهم في جعل المجتمع والعالم بشكل عام مكانا أفضل للعيش فيه وتشمل برامج تعزيز المسؤولية الاجتماعية كل من الأنشطة الصفية واللا صفية وتشجيع مبادئ التنمية المستدامة داخل الحرم الجامعي علاوة على الخدمة الخدمات الاجتماعية والبرامج التربوية للطلاب خارج الحرم الجامعي وتزداد المسؤولية الاجتماعية للجامعات بدرجة أكبر في الاقتصاد الحديث المدفوع بعوامل العولمة والتقدم في تقنية المعلومات والابتكار العلمي والتقني والتنافسية العالمية وتحتاج الجامعات لتطبيق تقنيات ومعرفة جديدة لمجابهة التحديات العالمية الرئيسة بما فيها تغير المناخ والفقر والصحة والغذاء والصراعات وأن يكون لديها أهدافاً بعيدة المدى للتحديات التي تواجه المجتمع وأن تشجع السلام العالمي وأن تغرس في نفوس الطلاب الفهم والتقدير للثقافات المتنوعة والرغبة في تقديم المساعدة للآخرين وجعل العالم مكاناً أفضل للعيش فيه في مجال التدريس والتعلم هناك خدمة مهمة تسديها الجامعات للمجتمع في رعاية رأس المال البشري لدعم تنمية البلد على المستوى الاجتماعي والاقتصادي والعلمي وفي هذا المسعى فإن على الجامعات ضمان إتاحة الفرصة المتساوية في التعليم للجميع ولذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة والفئات الأقل حظاً في المجتمع وتقع على الجامعات مسؤولية ضمان ألا تخضع برامجها الأكاديمية والبحثية فقط لمتطلبات سوق العمل وأن تشجع المناهج متعددة التخصصات لربط العلوم الطبيعية التطبيقية بالعلوم الاجتماعية وعلى هيئة التدريس الأخذ في الاعتبار اعتماد منهجية متعددة التخصصات في التدريس والتكامل بين العلوم الطبيعية والتطبيقية والاجتماعية حتى لا تنعزل المعرفة عن سياقها وبنفس القدر على الجامعات التأكد من أن المقررات المتخصصة تشمل أموراً كالبيئة والتأثير الاجتماعي والتداعيات الأخلاقية للنشاط العلمي ويتعين تعريف الطلاب بالمفاهيم الأخلاقية والمسؤولية الاجتماعية وإدراك التحديات العالمية وتشجيعهم على العمل محلياً والتفكير عالمياً وكذلك تشجيع برامج التبادل الثقافي بين المؤسسات التعليمية في بلدان أخرى وبذلك يمكن الجامعات المساعدة بقدر أكبر في تعزيز مفهوم التعدد الثقافي وتحسين مهارات فهم الثقافات الأخرى أما في مجال البحث العلمي البحث العلمي ضروري في إنتاج المعرفة 
لخدمة المجتمع وتحسين نوعية وجودة الحياة وبدأت بعض الجامعات سعيا منها لتحسين مركزها في التصنيف العالمي للجامعات في إغلاق بعض الأقسام التي يكون لها ناتج بحثي متواضع في استقطاب باحثين ذوي مهارات عالية من البلدان المتقدمة إلا أنه ليس من الضروري أن يكون البحث العلمي هو الرسالة الأساسية لمعظم الجامعات إن بعض الأبحاث المتقدمة في الطب وعلم الوراثة على سبيل المثال تثير قضايا أخلاقية ويمكن أن يكون لها آثارا اجتماعية خطيرة وتقع على الجامعات مسؤولية ضمان معالجة هذه القضايا بشكل مسؤول بأن لا تأخذ في الحسبان البيئة الأخلاقية المحلية فحسب بل جانبها العالمية كذلك وقد تسببت التقنية المتقدمة واحتدام المنافسة إلى زيادة الغش والفساد إضافة إلى الرغبة في الصيت وتبوء مكانة مرموقة وهذا بدوره يؤدي إلى التلاعب بنتائج البحث العلمي علاوة على حالات الانتحال في الأوراق البحثية والأطروحات العلمية وعلى الجامعات اتخاذ كل الخطوات لتجنب حصول هذه الحالات وأن تغرس في نفوس أعضاء هيئة التدريس والطلاب التبعات الاجتماعية الناتجة عن الغش والاحتيال وعمل ومع الانخفاض العام في التمويل فإن البحث العلمي صار يمول في الغالب من القطاع الخاص وهناك حالات مول فيها القطاع الخاص البحث العلمي هادفا لتعزيز فقط مصالحه الخاصة في مجالات صناعة الأدوية والزراعة والمنتجات الغذائية أما بالنسبة للشراكة المجتمعية فمن بين أهم جوانب المسؤولية الاجتماعية للجامعات صناعة مواطنين منتجين ومسؤولين وتشجيع المشاركة الواسعة في المجتمع المدني وتنمية المهارات والاتجاهات لتحقيق ذلك وهو أمر من الأهمية بمكان في التعليم العالي ويعرف ذلك غالبا بالمهمة الثالثة والتي تشتمل على نقل التقنية والابتكار أيضا والتعليم المستمر وهذا الجانب في التعليم العالي جزء أساسي في التزام الجامعة لعموم المجتمع وهو بنفس الأهمية للخبرة والتجربة التربوية والتعليمية لكل طالب وعلى الرغم من أهمية هذا البعد للتعليم العالي إلا أنه نادرا ما يبرز في المناهج ويشكل الطلاب تروة ضخمة من الموارد القيمة في مساعدة المجتمعات التي ترفدها الجامعة بخدماتها فبالإضافة إلى أن الطلاب المنخرطين في الشراكة المجتمعية يمكن أن يتعلموا كيفية التعاطي مع القضايا الاجتماعية والسياسية والثقافية فإن هذا الانخراط يعزز الشعور بالمسؤولية المدنية ويشجع على زيادة الشعور بهذه المسؤولية لدى الخريجين ويجعلهم راغبين في العمل على تحسين نمط الحياة لكل شرائح المجتمع وتشجع الجامعات في البلدان المتقدمة طلابها على التفكير في خدمة المجتمع الدولي في البلدان النامية بمعدلات متزايدة وهذا النوع من المشاركة يعزز أنواعا جديدة من التعاون والتفاهم بين, التفق... بين الثقافات المتعددة أما في مجال الاستدامة البيئية في الجامعة فمن خلال تعزيز ممارسات التنمية المستدامة في كل جامعة يمكن أن تكون الجامعات النموذج والقدوة الحسنة التي يحتدى بها كأن تطرح الجامعات إجراءات لتوفير الطاقة والتشجيع على استخدام مصادر الطاقة المتجددة داخل الحرم الجامعي ويمكنها كذلك تقليل المواد التي يمكن التخلص منها وإعادة تدوير النفايات وبذلك تهيئ بيئة, تهيئ بيئة جامعية جاذبة وصحية وآمنة لهيئة التدريس والطلاب معا إن الإدارة التي تأخذ في الحسبان الاستدامة البيئية تتوائم بشكل وثيق مع السياسات الأخرى للإدارة المسؤولة وعلى الجامعات ممارسة إدارة تتسم بالعدالة والشفافية والمساءلة والأهم في ذلك كله المشاركة الكاملة للطلاب في هذه العمليات التي عبرها يمكن للجامعات تعليم طلابها جوانب مهمة في المسؤولية الاجتماعية خلاصة القول يمكن القول بأن الجامعات هي التي تدرب قادة وصناع قرار للمستقبل وللحاضر لذا فإن من مسؤولياتها ضمان أن يصبح خريجيها خريجوها مواطنين مسؤولين اجتماعيا وإذا كان الأمر كذلك فعلى الجامعات مقاومة التأثيرات بتحقيق الأرباح والنظرة إلى الأمور 
كما لو كانت سلعا تباع وتشترى وهي نظرة أسهمت وهي نظرة أسهمت فيها تأثيرات العولمة مما يحرف المؤسسات التعليمية عن مسؤولياتها الرئيسة باعتبارها مؤسسات اجتماعية تقع على عاتقها مسؤولية الحاجات المجتمعية طويلة الأجل إن كوكب الأرض في وقتنا الحاضر يمر بمن عطف خطير من النواحي البيئية والسياسية والاقتصادية وسيتحدد المستقبل بالقرارات التي يتخذها كل مجتمع على حدة وتقع على الجامعات مسؤولية الاجتماع مسؤولية الإسهام في المعرفة ورفع القدرة الفكرية التي سوف تحقق الصحة للمجتمعات والسلامة للبيئة إذا على المجتمعات التمعن في مسؤولياتها باعتبارها أحد الركائز المهمة الموجهة لها في كل مهامها الرئيسية شكراً لاستماعكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته